when I'm talking about the Old Testament and how it points to Christ, um, actually, a couple of my favorite passages or verses out of Isaiah that I've just heard recently, and it's just a reminder to me what they mean. I want to read a couple of them to you, talk about them real quick before we pray. So Isaiah 43, 18, 19. I want to summarize real quick just the, the previous part of this chapter. If you read Isaiah 43, it's God talking to the Israelites and reminding them who He is. He's saying, remember when I brought you out of Egypt? Remember when I did all of these signs and miracles? And He wants to get that set in their mind so they have that, they remember and know who He is. And then He says this in verse 18. Remember not the former things, or consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers, the desert. This is an amazing passage, because what he's saying is, listen, you know that I'm God, that I've done all these things for you, that I've brought you out of Egypt, and, and I've performed all of these miracles in your sight. And he says, but I want you to forget all that. Because that's nothing compared to what I'm getting ready to do. I'm, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to bring forth a path in the wilderness. I'm going to make springs or rivers in the desert. What he's saying is, of all the, the miraculous things that they have witnessed and the power and authority of God that has been in their lives, that is nothing compared to what he's about to do. He's about to bring forward Jesus. He's about to bring the Messiah. He's going to make paths in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And it's an amazing thing that he's pointing. This is just one more example of the Old Testament that is pointing forward to Christ. And I just, of course, think about that. We think about that more heavily maybe this time of year as we celebrate Christmas season. Um, that is a proclamation of Christmas. Right there. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. Then he says, do you not perceive? In other words, are you, are you not paying attention? I want to make sure that you catch this, see it, that you know what I'm doing. God is so good. I, it, it is so easy for me in my daily life. I'm sure none of you have this problem. It's just me, right? This is always confession hour where I get to have therapy in front of everybody. Does anybody else forget to perceive what? We don't forget the things of the past. So often we hang on to those things. And we're like living in the past and not really paying attention to what God has at this point done. He has made a way. He has brought rivers. He's brought life where there was only death. And you know, if we get so hung up in what we've been through or maybe how God acted in our lives, maybe how he didn't respond. We can get so hung up on those things that we don't pay attention, really focus on what is most important. That is that we have been given a new way. It's an amazing thing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you today for the amazing gift of our Redeemer. Father, I pray that we would not fo focus and concentrate on the past or we would not pay attention to have offered. God, sometimes it's hard for us to move forward in our lives or to even see a clear way ahead. Father, I pray that we would trust completely in you, knowing that you have gone before us, you have made the way, you have fought our battle, paid Christ, paid for our debt. Jesus, we thank you so much for your finished work that paid that debt. Of you alone have the way to have right standing. And I thank you. Pray that you would 
expand our hearts of service, our understanding of what your purpose is in our lives. Play love. Father, I pray that we, this time, meeting with family and having sometimes anxious, tense, peace, and peace. And I pray that you would keep our mouths closed, wouldn't speak when we're not supposed to, God, and that you would speak words. Timing. God, I pray that your word is written in the tablets of our hearts that we open our mouths, your words that speak your truth. God, help us to set aside our own minds, our own trust completely, holy in your plan. Father, we ask for courage. God, we ask for strength, for endurance, for perseverance. We ask for wisdom. We would make decisions that are pleasing to you. God, most of us pray for boldness. God, that we could lovingly and gently speak the truth, your word, to family, co-workers, those that old. Father, we thank you so much that we could gather this morning. We could offer praise to you, offer our prayers to you, word to you. Pray that your Holy Spirit be over every aspect of this time we have, pleasing. Ultimately, to glorify your name. God, we have many in our church family, many in our family members, and our friends that are in sickness. God, we pray more so that your situation display your or greatness, Father, that you all of it. Pray that we will not get Father, we will so great. Thank you for protection, guidance, I got to be honest, I struggled a little bit this week, um, which really is nothing new, uh, but we're in the book of Revelation this week. So this is what I'm preaching out of is as we finish up the, the New Testament for this year in our readings. Um, I got to say that when you just say the word revelation, when you're talking about scripture and you say revelation, do many of you just get something that comes to mind immediately? You already have an opinion or an idea of what revelation is. Um, so I'm just going to give you my standard revelation disclaimer. Okay, Anytime I, I teach or preach on revelation, I want to say this. I, I want to ask you to leave everything that you think you know about the book of Revelation we're going to set all that aside and just look at what it truly is. Okay, so now some backstory um, of, of actually the writing of the letter. I want to give that to you, and then we want to talk about what it is, and maybe more importantly, what it isn't. So this letter was written uh, around 96-ish A.D. That would have been roughly 60 years after Christ. It was written by the Apostle John while he was in exile on the Greek 
island of Patmos. Now, this is just a little Greek island off the coast of Greece. Uh, it's, it's like seven miles long by six miles wide. It's pretty small. Um, it's believed that John was exiled to this uh, island for the crime of preaching God's Word. Now, this was during the reign of the Emperor Domitian, who was really well known for forcing Christians to make a choice. They could either choose Caesar as God or Christ. So it really put them in a bind, right? And we think about the persecution and the trials and things that, that they're dealing with, and we'll get into that because really the temptation for Christians under the reign of Domitian was to deny Jesus and avoid the persecution that would follow if they didn't. So John is writing this from exile. And let me just say this, Revelation, this letter... When you read through it, it can be very confusing because of some of the imagery and symbolism that is used. But listen, this is not some cryptic, secretive text that's written in code that we have to uncover the timing for the end of the world. I mean, that's usually what we focus on. When we hear Revelation, we think, oh, this is the prophecy about the end days, right? The... It is. It's full of symbols and imagery, but all of these symbols and imagery are drawn almost exclusively from the Old Testament. So John is actually expecting the reader to go back and uncover the meaning of those symbols and imagery from the Old Testament. It does contain what we would say might be difficult or even fearful situations. But it's not just a collection of, of dark predictions that are meant to instill fear and discouragement into the reader. Okay, this is ultimately what Revelation is. It is, it's a heavenly perspective on history. And by history, I mean from the beginning to the end. So for some of us, that's still future, right? But it's a heavenly perspective of all of history so we can view the present in light of the final outcome. It offers us a glimpse at a glimmering future that we would be able to maintain hope, darkening present. Make sense? We often think Revelation is just about beasts and bowls and signs and seals and tribulation and trumpets. That's in there, but ultimately it's about instruction and obedience. It's about judgment, victory, salvation. So when we get caught up in some of the imagery and the pr predictions or prophecies, you know, I was having this conversation just right before service. You know, if you've ever read a book about Revelation, or if you've ever done a study into Revelation, what do, what's it always been about? What do the seals mean? What do the bowls mean? What do the trumpets mean? Who's the beast? Who's the Antichrist? Where's Gog and Magog? What's Armageddon? We, we, we get so caught up in that stuff that it's so easy to miss the ultimate purpose of why this is written. This is not simply about predictions and prophecies. It's really just about hope. A hope in Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see here as we work through this together, we're going to see a picture of Jesus Christ that is much different from the rest of Scripture. So, let me just read uh, the first or some of the first chapter of Revelation. We're going to be in chapters 1, 2. Uh, we'll probably uh, deal with chapter 3 a little bit. We'll jump to chapter 12, and then we'll probably just finish up with chapter 22, okay? So this is chapter 1. Let me read you, uh, we're going to start with verses 5 through 8. 4 through 8. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of of kings on earth. 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, was, is to come, Almighty. And we read in this that this, this is really kind of a version of the gospel message. It's reminding us who Jesus is, that He has always been, He always will be. That He is God and that He is deserving of all glory and dominion forever. And it's followed in verse <clears throat> excuse me, 12 by this amazing description of Jesus. And you'll note when we read this, this is no longer describing the meek lamb of sacrifice. But it's an all-powerful warrior king, the conqueror, victor. So John says this in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one was like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined and furnished, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining full strength. And when we read these kinds of things, this is what we focus on. We don't focus on the picture of a powerful conqueror Christ. We get hung up on, okay, so what are the lampstands and what are the spirits and what's with the sword coming out of his mouth? And we try to decipher seven stars and all this is is just an, an image, a description of an amazing authoritative king. And it does explain, he even says, as the mystery of the seven stars and the seven gold lampstands, those are the seven angels of the seven churches, the lampstands of the churches. It's just saying that Christ is in the midst of the churches. And it's a description of his power being displayed. You know, it moves in from this to the message to the churches. Right? It gives us a picture of who Christ is, and then He's amongst the churches. Well, then Jesus Himself has a message to those seven churches. And that's what chapters 2 and 3 are about. And so we've got uh, the church in Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I want to take a little bit of time and look at each one of those. And here's why. When I read this, I'm more focused... Maybe I should say less focused. I'm less focused on the prophecies, the Antichrist and the beasts and the seals. Here, Jesus is writing a letter. He is speaking directly to the churches. I'm kind of interested in what he has to say. And so my focus really is more on chapters 2 and 3 than all the rest of it. We could get into the seals and bowls and all that. We've, we've kind of touched on that um, I think last year we did, and then we can do some teachings on that, but that's really not the focus of this. If Jesus is going to speak to the church directly, anybody else interested to see what he would say? It's lined out right here, chapters 2 and 3. I'm going to read the first few verses in chapter 2. This is his letter to the church specifically in Ephesus. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. 
but I have this. You have abandoned the love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, paradise. What's really interesting to me, and we're going to just do an overview of, we're not going to read all of the seven churches, what he says, but we're going to do an overview because he says, some things are good, but I have one thing against you. Here he's saying, your, your works, your service, your toil, you have patient endurance, you're faithful, you're testing the false teachings, and you're discerning what is true and right, and these are good things. But this is what you have done. You have abandoned the love. Some translations, it says you've abandoned your first love. But it's really the love you had at first. And the word he's using here is the same word we've talked about for the last few weeks. It's agape. He's saying, listen, when you first came to know me, when you first believed in me, you had this agape love for one another. You had a sacrificial, uncircumstantial love. It was uncompromising. You served and you poured yourself out for those around you. And though you have tested for false teachings and you've been patient and you've endured much, You've moved away from them. The abandoned word means to yield it up or lay it aside. Almost an intentional. It's really easy to fade. Use that word. It's easy to fade. Sometimes when we first understand what Christ has done for us, when we have that first experience of repentance and we know that we know that we know the depths that we were in, that we were dead to Him in sin, and He breathed life into us eternal. And we are so grateful. And we have this love and desire to help everybody. We want everybody to know for time. Sometimes we just get to a place where we take that salvation, that redemption. Yet. And that agape love can fade and we maybe don't serve others. That we're saying, then you've been faithful, endured much. Back. That love you had at first, go back to that. Get that back. Rekindle that. Serve others. Love others the way you did first. Repent. Wrong word. He says, repent from where you are. Turn back that first love. He addresses the church in Smyrna verses 8 through 11, and he says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but do not fear what you're about to suffer. They're under heavy persecution. Remember, this is the time under Domitian where they were being forced to choose, right? Essentially, their God, their Savior, Jesus Christ, or their Emperor, Caesar. This is just Strictly encouraging. I know you're suffering. I know what you're going through. I know you don't feel like you have anything. It's going to get worse. But don't fear. I haven't forgotten you. I haven't given up. You have remained faithful. 
Hi. And then he talks to the church in Pergamum in verses 12 through 17. And he talks about their faithfulness, even to death, right? They were being martyred for their faith. He's saying that is such an amazing thing. But I have something against you as well. You have believed Paul's teaching. Some of you have turned to worshiping idols. Some of you have turned to sexual immorality. He mentions those things specifically, and he says, listen, you need to repent. Verses 18 through 29, he talks to the church in Thyatira. And he talks about their love and their faithfulness, their service, their patient endurance. Imagine for a moment if God himself, if Jesus Christ were to write you a note. Listen, child. You're loving, faithful, serve well. You've been patient and endure. Also, and again, they were indulging in idol worship and sexual immorality. Simply said. He says this hold fast to what you have till I come. In other words, you've got some good things within you. You've got some understanding. You, you do understand the word. You know who I am. Don't let the world grind that out of you. Hold on to it. Hold fast to that. Hold tightly to what you have till I get there. Till I come. Church in Sardis in chapter 3. It says this to the angel of the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. He tells them to wake up. See, they were dealing with an immense hypocrisy. Right? They had a reputation for being alive. They had a reputation for being this lively, growing, spiritually growth, growing church. <clears throat> Truly, they were dead. They weren't growing at all. And it makes me think of the many things that Jesus would say to the Pharisees. He'd say, you're whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. He said, you're like a polished cup. You look good on the outside, but the inside of the cup is filthy. And so the church in Sardis, he's saying, listen, you've got a reputation. You've built a reputation of being righteous and holy and good, but none of that's true. He says, remember what you once heard. He's not saying hold fast to what you have. He's saying you need to go back and remember the gospel. If you remember it, you will repent. Turn from the hypocrisy that you have and come back to me. And later in chapters, or excuse me, verses 7 through 13, 